Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We will be starting service in just a few moments, so at this time, I'll ask that everyone pay their final respects.
Good afternoon, everyone. For those of you speaking during service, please use this microphone, speak directly into the mic, and you're welcome to take your mask off so everyone can hear you on the live stream. I would say good afternoon, but just afternoon. We're here to remember Sydney, who passed away unexpectedly, loving and dedicated father to his five children, beloved partner, son, brother, uncle, and friend. He'll be missed dearly by all who knew and loved him, and the Martin family wishes to thank everyone for their prayers and thoughts at this difficult time. As we begin our service, We'll sing when the roll is called up yonder. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair. prepare for a scripture reading from Anishka. Let's have a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for being here to comfort us at this time. We pray for the families, the children, uh, those that are friends, uh, colleagues and associates. Uh, pray, Lord, that you would be with those that are grieving right now. Comfort them and encourage them. 
get them through this time. I pray, Father, that you would just hold them, hold them together, and carry them through the pain. We're grateful, Lord, that you are a God who hears us, a God who loves us, and a God who knows loss, for you let your son die for our sins, and you watched him die. We praise you, Lord Jesus, that you are such a good and gracious God that you would be here to comfort us in these times. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We have a reading from Proverbs 23 and verse 24. As I read from Proverbs 23, verse 4, it says, The father of a righteous child has great joy. A man who fathers a wise son rejoices in him. Sunday morning, I would hug him and we would fall to sleep together. When he woke up, it smelled to fried dumplings. My dad and I love my Nana's fried dumpling. My s- um, s- siblings and my uncles all lost that was special to them. That was my dad. He might have been your first best your, your you might have been your best friend or brother or co worker or your son, but he was my hero on earth. He was the world's best dad. We now have another scripture reading. Uh, Reverend Isaac Bempa, come on, sir. Our second reading is taken from Revelation 21, 1 to 7. And this is what is read. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned, for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them, and be their God, And God shall wipe away all tears 
from the eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I made all things new. Behold, I made all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that it's a test of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcome shall inherit all things, and I will be his God or their God, and they shall be my children. Again, the seven says, He that overcome shall inherit all things, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. Praise be to God. At this time, we have another song, Farther Along. The words are in your program.
tribute by Ian Burt, followed by a tribute by Michael Morissette. Hello, everyone. Uh, first, I'd like to start out by saying um, from the President uh, Weatherup of the Toronto District School Board, sorry, off the QP 4400, the union of which um, Sydney belonged, uh, you know, a very, um, I would say for this time, a painful, at least for me, because I have such a close uh, relationship with Sydney, uh, condolences from that end. But uh, with no further ado, I will get to this because I'd like for you to understand how I met Sydney. Sydney and I met when I was, um, I was working at Western Tech, that's his high school, and um, awesome guy. I could always remember that smile on his face from the first day that I met him. Uh, I was the security of the school slash um, outreach worker slash uh, guidance. But uh, the simple fact is that for Sydney to approach me on many occasions to strike up different conversations as into you know school, et cetera, just navigating the whole system, so to speak. So we kind of kicked off. It was, I wasn't the most popular guy because again, I'm a figure of authority, but it didn't stop Sydney at all. So that speaks to his character. So we were able to have great conversations every lunch in the mornings when he'd come into school. If he's late, he'll be running to class. I never, ever have to ever tell Sydney you get to class, never. He is a guy, a really integral person. Um, later on, uh, I guess uh, Sydney wanted to get a job because he's getting older. He, you know, he, he wanted to be productive and he came to me and he asked, how, about, how would I go about getting a job? And um, Annabella is here. And at the time, I actually, um, if, uh, if you don't know, Annabella is my son's mom. And I called her and I plead and I asked because I know every summer she would look for, some, for kids to work in the Parks and Rec program. And that was the relationship that we have. And I was able to get Sydney over there. And Sydney got that and he ran with it. He, from there, he moved, as you know, Sydney's a workaholic. He worked, he worked many jobs night and day. I don't know when this guy ever sleeps, but he's awesome. And um, from there, we, we kept in touch. Sydney started, because he became my colleague, as a matter of fact, because now Sydney started working with the board in the EA, in the position of, I think it was the EA um, in special needs. And um, he was excellent. Whenever he have any questions, again, he would contact me, even though I wasn't in his area. I am the executive for an entire different area, but he would always reach out to me, and I'll definitely always reply and assist him in whatever way I can. But um, with that being said, you know, to his kids, I want for you to understand that your father is an upstanding gentleman, and um, I would never have it any other way. He, he, he was just awesome. As I said earlier, he's the guy that you want to be, be like, simply because he, as I said earlier, he's a totally integral person. And I hope that's what I want to remember him as, because that's why I didn't really want to always look, because the last time I saw him, we were actually having a conversation at the center, and he was there, and um, his daughter came up, and we started uh, reminiscing about when he was in high school. And um, his daughter looked at him and told him, oh, Dad, you're old. And then I kind of looked back at myself, and I'm thinking, well, if Sydney's old, what am I? You know, so with that being said, I just want to put the lighter, thing, lighter piece in, uh, how I want to remember him is as celebrate his life and his legacy because 
as you know, I, thought, I, I personally think he was just getting ready to really take off and be the man he wanted to be. And, you know, but we do have his future here in front of us. And you guys are going to take this, and you need to run with it. He already st gave you the blueprint how to be successful. And I thank you so much. I would take a hell of a lot more time to talk about Sydney, but I do know that we are uh, time sensitive. So thank you. Good afternoon. This is a piece I wrote about Sydney called My Main Man. Sydney Martin entered my classroom and my life in November of 2017. He was hired as a special needs assistant on rather short notice to help manage a child who most definitely had special needs. And over the course of the next three and a half years performed that task most admirably. The manner in which he calmed and controlled that boy in the short term and shaped most positively in the long term is beyond description. The diminutive child that once used the weapons of biting, kicking, swearing, and spitting in his personal arsenal over time became another person altogether. That takes a gift. Sydney had a way, such a way with children and youth that was indeed a gift and one which I could not emulate in the same way despite my efforts. Sydney, he's gone south was my frequent and sometimes panicked cry. And in would step Sydney, my hero on more than one occasion, with patience, determination, and occasionally force to ultimately restore order from the chaos. Sydney's gift spread far beyond the child he was first hired to manage. Each of my students reaped the rewards of his ability, his calm, his caring, and his kindness there. From the intermediate to primary special education classes, to all the students who came under his coaching tutelage, as well as various students seeking comfort or an attentive ear. So many would come to know and love Sydney. And that is in addition to all the staff that welcomed his greetings every single day. His gentle demeanor, ready smile, and the ubiquitous sir and miss to each member of the staff were each a part of what made Sydney special. He and I experienced a variety of challenges in our classroom over the course of our time together but his steady professionalism consistently helped to calm the sometimes, and sometimes often, turbulent waters. Though he never played favorites, like most teachers, he had favorites. And these were the ones who, for various reasons, were fortunate enough to receive Sydney's special care. That meant more. More time, more attention, more Sydney love. It's my hope that these students will remember with fondness the love that they received and will not be too hurt by his absence. Sidney was fastidious in a good way about his clothing. Each item hung with care in the classroom closet and his Nikes, a pair for work and a pair for travel, all in fine condition. And he always wore the fragrance of clean. He took great care with all that he touched, in particular, his people. In our shared work environment, Sidney was a private person, not one to waste words, and so in retrospect, I wish I knew more about him. But I do know with certainty that he cared deeply for all around him, especially his family, and my heart goes out to each of them in this time of great loss. Sydney, our main man, will surely be missed. At this time, we have the eulogy by Denise Morgan. Um, <clears throat> I, I really wish I didn't have to stand here to eulogize Sydney, but um, when my dear friend Rosemary asked me I could not say no. Just before I read the eulogy, I want to read a tribute that one of Sydney's dearest friends, Jason, wrote. Jason could not be here, and he wrote a eulogy, uh, sorry, he wrote a tribute that I would like to read. 
It's called Timeline. It was 1996 when it all started for me. In geography class, our class desks were parallel. I met this classmate that goes by the name of Sydney. We had common interests, including music, food, and of course, basketball. When March break of, 19, of 97 kicked in, Sydney's basement is where our friendship flourished. We would go to shoot hoops at Beverly High School, then come back to Sydney's basement until late at night. God knows, this would not be possible if not for the love of Mother Rose. Fall of 97, grade 10 is, in, is now in effect. A lot of laughs, tons of arguments, but they didn't devalue our respect. Early January of 1998, some of our friends got expelled, others dropped out, but thanks to the Most High, he kept us focused through basketball and redirected our route. Summer of 98, we chilled on those brown bars on 2265 Jane Street and listened to Mob Deep until we fell asleep, or until Sydney's mother looked out the window at myself and Brian, and we took off on our bikes without a peep. Fall of 1997, as we arrived at the Coliseum School named Western Tech, we were happy because no more uniforms, but we were also afraid as we didn't know what to expect. January 2000 rang in with a smile, Sid, Brian, and myself all made the basketball team after waiting for a while. We met some amazing teachers, but one in particular was an amazing human being. Brother Ian, if you're in the audience, we appreciate your guidance. Now I know you're here, Ian. So after some time, we parted and communicated less, but never lost love for each other. From 2002 to 2005, Sydney got into the city of Toronto working on Raptor Ball, then eventually got me a job reminding me that a real brotherhood should never fall. Since then, we have kept in touch with a lot of grateful workers and the seniors at the city of Toronto. It's got to be hard not hearing more of his constant phrase, yo bro, I was most proud of Sydney when he got a full-time job with the City of Toronto after countless attempts and failures. But the lesson he taught me through that journey was to persevere and to turn words like, I'm sorry, into words like, when can you start? The next proud moment was when he went on vacation with his family after not being able to do so in years. When he got back, the first thing I asked was, how did it feel? How do you feel? He replied, honestly, I'm happy. After 24 years of knowing Sydney, AKA only Sydney, Alan Martin, I can say I truly lost a brother that genuinely had love for his children. In summary, Sydney Alan Martin was just a grateful being who enjoyed life and was a joy to be around. Sidney Allen Martin was born into this world on February 6, 1982. He was an extremely quiet and happy baby, a baby who enjoyed playing by himself, a baby who enjoyed quiet moments by himself. And so it is not surprising that Sydney grew up to be a very reserved and poised young man. Sydney's first classroom experience came about when he attended St. Philip Mary Catholic Elementary School. There he demonstrated excellence and was dubbed a very quiet student, one who was loved by all his teachers. Sydney High School years began at Regina Passis Catholic School, where he met his dear friends, Brian and Jason. After attending his school for about a year, all three determined that the school was not a good fit for them, and they ultimately decided to change course. Therefore, they left Regina 
Passis Catholic School to complete their secondary education at Western Technical High School. Sidney was an organized and obedient student. He obeyed the rules of the school. In fact, his friends would tell you that sometimes they're at school and the bell would ring and Sidney would run away leaving them. He was afraid not to make it to class in time. He did not want to be late for his classes. Sidney's actions could have resulted from just a character trait or the fact that he knew his mother was very strict and he did not want to get in trouble. Well, it had to be a character trait because Sidney never got in tr any trouble at school. In a recent conversation with his mother, I vividly recall her saying, I have never received a phone call from a teacher or principal about Sydney. She also said she told her boys not to have any teacher call her to complain about them at any time because if they do, she would kill them. Mm -hmm. And if you are from the West Indies or if you have West Indian parents, I'm sure you can relate. Amen. I'm also sure that you know not to take this literally. Shortly after high school, Sydney secured a job with the City of Toronto where he worked in different capacities, including a host for social events and a youth counselor. He also worked at various centers where he spent a lot of time, um, mostly at North Kipling Community Center where he focused on youths and the basketball program. In 2006, Sydney graduated from Humber College with a diploma in community worker program. Sydney understood the significance of ongoing education, so he took the necessary steps to further his education to ensure that he was competent in his roles and to make himself more marketable. Consequently, in 2011, he completed another diploma program, this time in social service worker. He also achieved a Builder's Envelope Certificate from Humber College in 2018. Sydney was destined for greatness. In the year 2016, Sydney pursued a position of the Toronto District School Board and was successful. He worked on a part-time basis until he secured a full-time position as an educational assistant at Silverthorne Community School. He was elated. Sydney knew that a full-time position with the Toronto District School Board does not come easy, so he pulled out all the values and principles that were instilled in him in his life early to make sure his performance was stellar. You have just heard Mr. Morissette and Ian speak about Sydney's character. It is true. Throughout his life, Sydney remained a very private person. He was so private, not even his mother knew what was going on in his life. I can recall a number of occasions when his mother would call me to ask me to talk to Sydney to pry into Sydney's business. Not knowing how to say no to Rosemary, I would casually talk to Sydney, but my goal was to fish for information. Despite my efforts, Sydney remained tight lipped. I think he assessed the situation well. He did not tell me his business because he knew I would tell his mom. And I did. After all, I was on a secret mission. As fate would have it, on June 9, 2021, Sydney succumbed to a sudden illness despite emergency care by paramedics and the healthcare team at Humber River Hospital. In the community in which he grew up and still lived, Sydney was well loved and respected. He was a role model. To his brothers, Damien, Lamar, and LaVon, we know how much you looked up to him. We also know how much you were missing him right now. To his children and partner, he really loved and cared about you. He will be your guardian angel. To Mother Rosemary, we know how wholeheartedly devastated you are because of the sudden death of your son. But I hope the fact that you now learn that he was an incredible person, incredibly special to many, I hope that will provide you some comfort. Sleep in peace, Sydney, or Junior, as I affectionately call you. Thank you.
At this time, we're going to take a few moments to explore the scriptures. Just I won't keep you long. Um, I've known the family here for some time. They've known me since I was a youth. And uh, we've been through a lot of world and life together. And I'm grateful for all of them. Today I wanted to just take a brief look at Genesis 1, 26 and 27 and draw some things out for us to consider in our lives. In this whole uh, pandemic, last year was very different. This year um, I've been innovated with, inundated I should say, with weddings. Lots and lots of weddings, people who put off stuff for last year. And when I got this call and I heard what was going on, it broke my heart. But when we come to these times in our lives, it is important for us to understand what is important. It's very difficult for us to contemplate life and death. Um, Unfortunately, I understand where the kids are. My father died when I was 15, back home, where I grew up. And I am going to be 55 in a few days. He's been gone a long time, and it still hurts. But I want us to look at what the Bible says to us about life and about who we are. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, uh, if you're familiar with the Bible, you will probably know what these verses say. It says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image. According to our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. Father, guide our thoughts this morning, and I pray that anybody here who does not know you as Savior would hear today and understand the gravity and the reality of life and call on you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Funerals are uncomfortable places to be for all of us. None of us want to contemplate that death is real. The older you get, you realize you have less and less time. Um, but there are also times for us to contemplate what is most important in life. Uh, my wife once made me watch an episode of Little House on the Prairie where the lady faked her death just so her children would come and see her. Unfortunately, that happens. A lot of people don't see each other for long periods of time, but then they show up to the funeral. And it's unfortunate that uh, the very people that love you the most sometimes don't come to see you when you're alive. They don't interact with you. And we sometimes get our priorities out of whack. We get involved with things and forget about our people. But the Bible says here we're made in the image of God. And you just want to in, in look at three things quickly. First of all, we're a triune people. We're made mind, body, and spirit. Mind, body, and spirit. My mom has Alzheimer's. Her body is pretty good for 87, but her mind is gone. She recognizes me a little bit, but she's gone. And there's nothing we can do about that. But I also know that she trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as her Savior when she was a little girl growing up in Barbados. She was in her teens where, where she got saved at a Billy Graham crusade uh, in Barbados growing up. And uh, so I know her spirit is good. And one day she will get a new body and a new mind to complement her living spirit. And then her mind, body, and spirit will be perfect. But all of us in this room are mind, body, and spirit. The body is going to die. And there's nothing you can do about that. Sometimes it's difficult to be told the truth and to come to face with these things, but it happens every day. Every day. 
your body is going to die, you're going to be healthy, you're going to be you know, fit and strong, and all of those things will happen. Your mind may be good. Maybe some of you have weaker bodies, but your mind is sharp. You're still going to die. Mind, body, and spirit. We're made, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Mind, body, and spirit. We're all made of three parts. What else do we have in the image of God? We have free will. We have the ability to choose for ourselves. How many of you have children? I know there are children here. How many of you have ever had a child look at you and then do exactly what you told them not to do? I have three children. That's called free will, even in children. Toddlers, I don't care how old or how young they are, don't do that, and they will look you in the face and go and do exactly what you told them not to do, and they will look to see your reaction. Okay? Free will. Right? Um, uh, Denise was just talking about growing up in the West Indies. You know, when I was a boy growing up, my father was about six foot ish and about 220 pounds. My mom, 5'4 and 160, maybe 150. I would rather take a beating from my dad any day over my mom because my mom would talk and beat. And the longer she talked, the more you got beat. My father was efficient. He came in, got it done, got over, and walked out. And so the goal was always to push mom to the point where she said, wait till your father gets home. It was like, perfect. You're still going to get beat, but I know how long I'm going to get beat for. It's going to get done, get over with, and move on with life. But we all have free will. We have the will to choose right, and we have the will to choose wrong. And sadly, too many of us choose wrong. We all know right from wrong. Uh, you know, you don't have to memorize the Bible to note the Ten Commandments in your head. We all know that stealing is wrong, and adultery is wrong, and murder is wrong. We know these things are wrong. It's because God made us in His image, and God is a moral God. He put in us a moral code. He made us in His image. We know right from wrong. And if you don't know the Ten Commandments, Jesus watered it down and distilled it down to two commandments. Anybody know what they are? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and you shall love your neighbor. As you, if you can't memorize the 66 books of the Bible, Jesus distilled it down to two statements. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul and all your strength. And the second is like the first. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So now you know. The first four commandments cover the first statement. The last five commandments, six commandments, including your parents, cover the last one. The neighbor is yourself. You know it all. You know right from wrong. You know how to choose. Well, we have free will. God has given us everything we need. Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us, came and died to save sinners. We are sinners. We fail. The word sin means to miss the mark. How many of you ever played darts? How many of you are good at darts? Me either. I don't care how hard you try. If you're trying to hit the bullseye, somehow you always miss. And then when you don't want to hit it, that's when you get it. Well, see, God is perfect. God doesn't even have to try to hit the bullseye. He just throws the dart. And he just hits the bullseye every single... He doesn't even look. Time. But we can't do that. And that's what missing sin, the word literally means to miss the mark. Well, that's what we are. We miss the mark. And don't tell me that you don't know. Again, anybody who's had children, a little five-month-old child will lie to you. They will have a clean diaper, a full belly, and safety and security. They will scream in their cribs that something is wrong. And if you're a parent long enough, you know which is the hungry cry, which is the angry cry, and which is the pay attention to me cry. You know them, and you know what to do with them. But we all know that. How many of you are parents, if you had to teach your child how to disobey, put your hand up. Did you have to run a course, pull up YouTube videos for them? Johnny, Susie, this is how you disobey me. 
No, because our nature is to do wrong. And that's a sad situation we're in. But Jesus Christ came and gave his life on the cross so that we can be redeemed from our sins. And lastly, I told you I would not keep you long. We're made in the triune God. So God, Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit, you and I are mind, body, and soul. God has free will. He can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants. He's a sovereign God, and he made you with free will to choose right from wrong. But last but not least, because God is an eternal God, he made you an eternal person. You are going to live forever somewhere. You are going to live forever. Nobody just ends up in the dirt and that's it. Human beings were built to live forever. Where you live forever is up to you. All of us are going to live forever. Every single one in this room are going to live forever. We see the body and it dies, unfortunately, this dear brother. Some, some think that this is the end, but the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, is appointed unto a man or a woman wants to die, and after this, the judgment. There's no judgment for dead people. If you're in a court case and you're the defendant and you die during the case, the case is over. There's nothing they can do to you. But the Bible tells us that after a man dies or after a woman dies, there's a judgment, which means you're living somewhere else. Because we are eternal beings. God made us to be eternal beings. We're going to be judged for how we lived. Now, many modern Christians cannot imagine that God would make a place called hell, but he did. And in fact, if you study the New Testament, you will find that Jesus spoke about hell more than he spoke about heaven. He wanted people to understand there's consequences to our actions. But God is also merciful. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, it says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some men lack slack, slackness, but he's uh, long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. God loves you so much, and he wants us to be in heaven with him. But the choice is up to you. Remember, free choice, free will. You can choose where you want to spend your forever God will not force that on you. He's provided everything for you through Jesus Christ. The Bible says in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And I'll close with this verse for you. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The choice is ours to make. When I was 14 years old, standing in the National Stadium in Barbados, listening to a crusade, I gave my life to the Lord. It's 41 years ago. I pray that you will have that experience. If not today, maybe you've had it in the past. Well, praise the Lord for that. Maybe not today, maybe tomorrow, but that you will not leave this life and enter the next life without Jesus. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your holy scriptures that makes us aware of the truth. Father, be merciful to us sinners. Comfort this family. Strengthen them and encourage them. And Lord, may they cling to you for the hope that trans just, just transfers us out of all the pain and suffering. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Brother Isaac, sir, he's going to come and have a closing prayer for the family. Let's all stand together, please. You know, looking at that guy there, he almost beat me. I thought I was workaholic, but listening to a little bit, in fact, he almost beat me. I knew him from Maxwell Megan Center. And the next was the city of Toronto, which my bosses and colleagues are here. So he is a worker. And we all appreciate what he did for us all. Before I pray, uh, pray though, I just have a test, something to reflect on it. And this is what it says. 
one day we shall all go home to meet our maker. One there was a king who lives in the faraway country. He had three children, two sons, one daughter. One day, a farmer struck the land, and they only had food for two days. So he sent his children to go and buy food from the city, which is three days' journey. The children were eager to go. So early in the morning, he sent them off. Before they get to the market, there were some tournaments going on in the stadium. But the father's words were echoing their ears. So they went to the market. And they bought the food, the food stuff. And the girl saw some of her friends parading and doing fundraising and several activities. So she was invited. The friends asked her to host the program. She could not say no, so she gave in. She gave the food stuff to the security guard to watch for her while the program is going on. She told the brothers, go on, so she would meet them in the three junction. The boys got all that the father asked them to buy and began to go back home when they reached the stadium, the older brother told the younger brother and said they should watch the game for five minutes. But the younger brother said, no, oh no. Because when they were coming, the father had no food to last him for the third day. So he left to go home. While the older brother was watching the game, some of the teammates recognized him and told the coach because they were losing the game. The tournament was so popular, the coach arranged for him to play. So he gave his food stuff to a security guard. And finally, they won all the games. He got so many trophies and awards. But before the game started, it was announced that there will be an earthquake, hurricane, tornado, all coming seven hours after the game. The game is completed. When the games were over, he received so many trophies and awards. All the people rushed to shake his hands. It was a long lineup because he was a prince and, no, and number one player on the field. Unfortunately, he did not hear about the weather so everyone quickly left him. The coach was the last person to thank him and inform him about the hurricane. He finally remembered to look for the security guard who he gave the food to watch for him. But notice that the food had been eaten by wild animals. So he decided to go home with tears and empty handed. He began crying and wailing. He met the sister at the three junction, and both were crying with empty hands. Minutes later, the earthquake struck the entire kingdom. Darkness occupied the land. They heard a strange voice saying, come, come with me. You unfaithful children, your father, the king, your brother, and their household has been moved to safety. They are safe by you being an ungrateful children. You will stay in the darkness with me and the wild beast to eternity. I want you to reflect the scripture that was read. Revelation 21, 7, it says, All who overcome shall inherit everything. And then he said, He, that God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, will be their father, and we will be his children. Let us pray. My father, holy father, it is a challenge time. How can the family say thank you? How can the loved one say thank you? When we see our loved one, 
right there, saying goodbye. Journey, no return. Father, but you said in your words, in all things, we should give you the glory. And this is the reason we're thanking you, not for taking dear Father, but you know why. Only you have a reason. It's not about the sickness or whatever killed him. No. It's about your timing. You are the God that gives. You are the God. In your time, you take it. And therefore, Father, the children, only you can wipe their tears. Yes, mom can do it. Grandma can do it. Nobody can do it because their future is in your hands. And as you hold your father in the bosom of our father Abraham, Father, I also pray for the family, the entire family, the mom, the siblings, the wife, whoever. Father, you are the God that wiped tears. You are the God that blessed. You are God that will comfort them. Their life live are in your hands. Be glorified. From today, let your name be glorified. Let them remember you more than ever, more than anything. Regardless of their wrongdo whereabouts, you be the God of their life. And we, the entire family, the loved ones, the maids, the colleagues, the bosses, Father, it is your will for this day to happen, for each one to be here at this moment. And therefore, you see every heart. You represent every person that represent here. Don't let them go home in vain. Touch them in your way. Because you are merciful, God. Go with them, Lord. Go with them. As we go, as we say goodbye, Lord, be there for them. Wipe their face. Touch their hearts, their mind, their life left. Let it glorify you. Father God, we thank you for everything, for this day. In fact, for taking our brother, our loved one, our father, keeping him in your own way. As the preacher preached, there's a way, there's a place that all will go. His time has come. Everyone, our time will come. Remember your creature, the God who made you your maker, who will make a way where there's no way. We bless you, Holy One. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This concludes the service for Mr. Martin. On behalf of the family, I'd like to thank you for your support and attendance here today, and thank you to those who joined us on live stream. In a moment, we'll be proceeding to Beechwood Cemetery. The route that we'll be taking is making a right onto Derry, a right onto Airport, a right onto Spiels, a left onto Jane Street, and a right into the cemetery. We are in section 14. Please note only 75 people are permitted inside the cemetery. And due to the recent rainfalls, there are some unstable grounds at the cemetery that will not allow us to go directly to the grave. In a moment, I'll have pastor lead us out, followed by the casket and family and friends behind. I'll ask that the pallbearers meet us outside just by the front door to assist lifting the casket. On behalf of myself, Jade Hibbert, and the New Haven team, I'd like to thank you for allowing us to serve you.
Thank you. 